Media Engineering Digital Culture Speaker Series. And today it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, a friend of mine, Stephen Thomas, or Steve Thomas, as I know him. Um, I'm going to read his brief bio and then say a few other things. So, uh, Stephen Wayne Thomas is a Los Angeles based music educator, film composer, audio engineer, field recordist, and post production music editor with over 20 years of experience in the music and entertainment industry. He began his music education at the University of Colorado Conservatory of Music before being scouted as a keyboardist and singer-songwriter in Tokyo, Japan, where his eclectic career encompassed a record label deal, DJ slash host for a top 10 music show, and session vocalist for other signed recording artists. There he learned to navigate the business of entertainment and understand the demands placed on its industry artists and professionals. Upon returning to America, Thomas began his immersion into the world of audio engineering and music technology, culminating with a decade plus of higher education, audio engineering instruction and professional mentoring. In addition to instruction at the Indiana, Indiana University Jacobs School of Music, he is also the music editor and audio tech instructor for the Palomar Film Scoring Workshop an intensive one week program focused on the drama of writing music for pictures, Hollywood style workflow, collaboration and networking. In the world of film and television, Thomas works as a composer or Steve, I should say, <laughs> or mixer and music editor. Recent features, feature films he has worked on include Child's Play 2, Tesla 2020, and uh, the recent Netflix uh, posted film, The Outpost. I'd also like to say that he's one of the most wonderful human beings I've ever met, <laughs> incredibly generous person. And if he ever invites you for dinner, you should absolutely say yes, because he's oh, yeah. a fabulous cook. <laughs> so um, Steve is open to questions uh, throughout the session. So uh, Robert and I will try to keep an eye on it and maybe jump in occasionally, but you, sh you yourselves should free feel free rather to, uh, you know, turn on your mic and, and post a question even while he's presenting. So take it away. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Luke. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Thank you uh, to ASU um, and everybody there for, for having me today. Uh, I, I've, I've watched the other uh, sessions and they're a lot more scientific and heady than what mine is going to be today. So hopefully this will be uh, just as interesting and compelling for everyone, kind of learning about the, uh, you know, how the film industry works um, and, uh, and things that we, you know, that we do uh, to make, um, to, to tell story, tell stories with sound, um, which is super important. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself, um, how I got here, uh, I'm speaking with you today. So I... Uh, as Luke mentioned, I spent a lot of time in Tokyo. So let me tell you, I got there. Um, so when I was in high school, uh, I wanted to be a film composer. And that was, uh, you know, uh, mid 80s, I guess, at the time. And all up until then, I was kind of had a passion for music and had other venues that I could possibly go down graphic design or, or fashion. Um, my mother's a graphic designer. So um, I, I was open to a lot of opportunities that I could take, but I always came back to music because I just felt like I had a passion for it. You know, if you know that, you know, if you don't have to be told to sit down and practice or to, if you're staying up at two till two in the morning doing music or your parents have to kind of yell at you to come, you know, come to dinner, that's, you know, will kind of give you an indication maybe of, of you know, that's something that you might want to um, kind of pursue. Um, and I did. And uh, when I was in high school, there was, uh, I was playing, I was teaching, I wasn't teaching piano, I was kind of teaching piano, but I was uh, accompanying other high school students and we were at this, um, uh, I guess it's uh, at this music uh, store and we were there because that's where all the tryouts were happening for the state competition. Flutist, you know, flautist and, and so forth. Um, so I was there accompanying some people and while I was there waiting, one of the music guys was like, hey dude, check this out. And he showed me this keyboard and it was, uh, it was a Roland S50. And if you are familiar with gear, then you'll know that's one of the first kind of keyboard samplers that came out that you could actually, you know, program stuff and play back 
kind of, you know, orchestra sounding instruments. The memories on those cards at the time were so tiny. Uh, I mean, you have more, you know, your, your email probably has more, uh, takes up more memory than these little floppy disks did back in the day. And you could even hook up a little monitor to it. And it was like a kind of a dot matrix grid where you could program stuff. So went home to my parents, my birthday was coming up and, uh, surprisingly my, my dad offered to buy me this thing and it was expensive. It was like 3000 bucks in 1986. So it was a lot of money, especially for, for my family. And, uh, and then I just kind of jumped in and like every hour I, I, uh, in, you know, of the day I could, I was working on like doing what we call mock-ups now. And, uh, so it's, you know, so I wasn't writing at the time yet. It was more of, um, copying, right. You know, kind of like copying the greats, copying other film scores and trying to make them sound real. So I would take these, you know, demo tapes, I guess, back to the, my band room in, in high school and show my director. And he's like, oh, that sounds really good, but you need to write your own stuff. And uh, so eventually I did. I went to school and, you know, at that time uh, there weren't a lot of film scoring uh, kind of programs back in that day. It was really just Berkeley, you know, College of Music out there in Boston. And, uh, and that was just kind of out of out of reach for for my family as far as you know uh, tuition goes so it's like okay i'll you know, i'll just stay in state and, and i went up to the university of colorado and the idea was then just to be a professor you know and uh, and do all those professor things you know i'll take do some lessons and play in the symphony and that's how i'm going to make my money you know i figured uh and kind of gave up the uh, you know the film scoring you know uh part of it and that kind of just kind of fell by the wayside um but uh so a little while after that, um, my, my mother's Japanese and uh, my, my grandmother was, wasn't doing so well. So she moved back to Japan and uh, she's like, hey, why don't you come over here and, you know, just kind of visit or whatever. So I go and while I'm there, she's like, hey, there's this performing arts school and you want to try it. And I was like, oh, sure. You know, I'm here, you know, and uh, I'm kind of, Luke kind of knows I'm, I have the personality. I usually don't say no to gigs and it's just like, bring it on. I'll figure it out later. And uh, which, you know, for, <clears throat> for our, you know, students and the uh, younger, you know, artists and stuff, uh, kind of starting out here, you know, that's kind of a good, you, you might think about taking that philosophy when you get started, you know, um, cause you, you know, you, you'll, you'll challenge yourself and you'll hopefully open yourself up to a lot of opportunities. So I, I go to this school and, uh, and it's, it's a whole performance thing, you know, it's like dance and all of that. And I had, you know, taken kind of Latin dance in high school and, you know, my mother was very much, you know, making me very Asian mom. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got to do all these things that I could do, I wanted to do. And, uh, so, uh, there's a concert coming up and uh so i i play this kind of pop song that's really popular that's kind of on the charts at the time i play piano sing it live and i get some uh some of the other uh uh performers that were at the school to sing live background vocals for me um and this particular school had a lot of kind of a good track record because it had sent you know other artists to tokyo and they were like kind of blowing up right now so one of those uh bands kind of a uh, girl band pop pop band, J-pop band, uh, came back and uh, that was from the school and uh, so uh, to this concert and uh, so I got to meet them. But then the producers also came down, you know, the, the president and uh, kind of the VP of this production company. And uh, so I met them and, you know, I didn't think anything of it. A couple of days later, I get a phone call and it's like, hey, we, we like what you're doing. You have an interesting look. You know, there's no one like me on TV, you know, at that time. Um, who wasn't totally Japanese. So they scout me out and they send me up to Tokyo and I go there and like two days after I'm there, I think it's like, it's wardrobe and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, Hey, we're going to put you on TV. You're a good piano player. So boom, it's like, you know, two days uh, into Tokyo and I'm on TV playing keyboards behind uh, this artist named, uh, uh, I think it's Miy Miyaki Arisa. Um, and, uh, Oh, it's just so long ago at this point in time. Anyway, uh, so long story short, I do a whole bunch of those. And, uh, and I'm, I think I was turning 21 at the time. I think I was had my birthday, you know, uh, and, uh, I was a very young and stubborn, uh, man at the time, uh, a boy, I guess, young man. And, uh, so I did not want to deal with any, like the rules and restrictions that, you know, kind of my Japanese culture side was applying, you know, pushing to me. So basically they, they fire me because I, you know, I don't come home at the right hours of the day. Sometimes I don't even come home, you know, the, the place I'm staying, uh, and, uh, cause I'm trying to have fun, you know, it's Tokyo. 
So they fire me and that's a huge shock to my ego. Oh my gosh, you know, that was like really devastating. And uh, so I picked up, you know, myself right away and I was like, they're not gonna stop me. I put some clothes in a box, I go back up to Tokyo, I crash with my relatives and I just start, you know, working and trying to make it there. And uh, so I had made a couple of contacts and uh, and then one thing leads, leads to another. And, you know, I, I start doing session vocals for EMI records and, you know, all these kind of little gigs um, uh, doing like anime sessions where I'm like, play the hero, I get to sing the hero, you know, and, and do crazy stuff like that there. Um, and, uh, and the background vocal stuff too was fun because uh, if you guys remember um, laser discs, you know, back in the 90s, if some of you uh, can remember those, uh, um, you know, karaoke is so huge there. So I would actually go in there and do these karaoke sessions for EMI records. And uh, back then, you know, you could like turn off the voice uh, on these, you know, the laser discs. So you can like practice, you can like hear the singer and practice, and then you can turn it off, you know, and then, you know, sing yourself. So I did all these sessions where I was like the kind of the white male vocalist and I would do all the Beatles stuff and uh, Tears for Fears, you know, um, Elton John, Billy Joel, all of that. So if you have one of those laser discs, you, know, you probably that's my voice on there. Um, so a lot of wacky jobs like that, you know, it paid well. And that was the first time I got to go in a big studio too, you know, with like the huge consoles that you need an intercom to talk to somebody on either side. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was doing this, like, this is what I want to do. You know, uh, this is what I have to do. Um, so they, I get signed to a, a record deal there. Um, and then I do like VJing and all this kind of stuff. And I'm, while I'm working a side job, I'm like, you know, breasting and making coffee, making drinks. I'm a bartender, wine bar. Uh, I do flower arrangements. Um, you know, just anything I could do because it's very expensive. You got to work like six jobs. If you guys are from New York or someplace like that, you get it. Um, and, uh, and just tried to be a sponge, you know, while I was there. Um, my Japanese was excellent by the time I left. And, uh, so while I was there, you know, I got, I, I was this, you know, singer songwriter. And so I was getting to be about like 27 and that's really old, you know, in Japan, uh, for like a pop artist. So they were like, mm, you're kind of old now. So, uh, you know, um, maybe we, we need to turn you into a producer instead. How about that kind of thing? Working behind the scenes, producing, you know, their artists. And I was like, that's awesome. And I kind of, you know, I knew my ticket was kind of like running out on the, on the, on the record deal singer songwriter thing. Cause it just wasn't happening. Um, so it's like, I need to get some tech skills is what I decided to do. So it's like, I go, I come back to the U S um, and I actually go to, uh, I had, they wouldn't let me go for a long time. Um, and I, they're very kind of restrictive of, of my comings and goings. So it's like, I couldn't come back to the States and study like two years and then go back there. Even like two, uh, like six months was kind of a stretch. So I found this recording school in Ohio, um, in Chillicothe, Ohio called the Recording Workshop. And it's still there today. It's kind of like a guerrilla school for, for audio. And, uh, and you go there and you live on campus in these cabins and, uh, and it's just audio 24 seven, basically while you're there. So I, I, I do these kind of crash course engineering skills and I guess I'm good at it. Uh, they want to hire me as an intern. So I call up my label. It's like, Hey, you know, I'm They want me to be an intern. I need to study more. Let me stay a little bit longer. And, uh, and they agree. Um, while well, they're still paying me too, which was nice. Uh, and, uh, and then one year passed and then two years passed. And, uh, after about that second year, uh, actually I, after I did my internship, they hired me. So I got a job there too. And I like, you know, called them up again. It's like, Hey, I got to stay a little longer. They want to actually, you know, to do stuff. And, uh, so after about two years into that, I kind of walked away from my contract, um, you know, different priorities, a little older, about almost 30 at the time and, uh, and decide, you know, families back here in the States, my parents getting older and so forth. Um, so, but I continue working there and just kind of honing my skills. So I'm recording all kinds of bands, heavy metal, rock, pop, bluegrass, you know, all of these different things, commercials and so forth. And really just kind of getting a, um, a crash course and, um, kind of a brutal beating, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with these kind of like not very good bands, you know? So that made me be a really good engineer, actually. You know, if you, if you have a really good artist, it's kind of easy to produce them and make them sound good. But if you have a terrible band, you know, that's, that's, uh, really kind of, you cut your teeth on that kind of stuff. Um, so one thing leads to another and, uh, and then I started getting into the, the tech side of stuff. I was always very good with the digital, you know, side of audio, which was just coming out when I was transitioning into being an engineer. 
And uh, so I know both worlds. I know tape, and then I, uh, um, I was lucky enough to kind of come out at the tail end of that. Um, but I'm really good at tech, and uh, one of the main programs that I use is called Digital Performer. Some of you guys might know that. And uh, it's great for film scoring. But uh, so I start doing all these, I get a call from like some guy I used to work with at the recording workshop. And he's like, hey, you know, I have this tutorial business and uh, you want to like make a tutorial on DP? And I'm like, sure, you know. So I, you know, never say no and uh, jump into that. And then for about three or four years, I just make all kinds of tutorials. And this was back before YouTube, right? So you actually had to buy these on physical DVD. So you could go to Guitar Center or any place like that. And uh, it was called this cool schools line of uh you know tutorial stuff so it was like you made a course it was basically courses that i was making you know and then i did logic and then pro tools and all kinds of other ones um and i started project managing too of like other photoshop stuff like that word you know for microsoft <clears throat> and uh so that really got me going on the tech side and like also like figuring out how to teach the stuff right and how to like put this in a kind of digestible format for people to understand um uh, and then, then that takes me kind of to my university, you know, uh, old, uh, bandmate of mine who I used to work with got a job as the director at, uh, this private school in Columbus, Ohio called Capital University. And, uh, so they hired me on cause they're, uh, one of their professors is retiring and it, he was teaching the media class and it was really old and janky and, uh, hadn't been updated. And, uh, and that's the kind of the trap sometimes that universities fall into is because, you know, the, you don't have, you know, a, a, there are a lot of cases where, you know, the professor isn't out there doing stuff. And um, so they were like wanting to bring me in kind of fresh. So that was great. So, but I didn't know how to any, do any of that. I didn't know how to do dialogue. I didn't know how to do sound effects. And uh, so I just had to taught my, teach myself. And, uh, and I just jumped in and, you know, then I read a lot, watched a whole bunch of movies and just started doing it, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and then one thing that loved another, got the post-production class there, really expanded it. Um, and uh and about that time when i started working at capital um i was like i want to get back into film scoring so i started you know kind of making that plan uh and it takes a lot because i you know like out in columbus ohio really in the midwest you know back then even 10 years ago there's not a lot of places that you can go to learn post-production audio or learn how to be a filmmaker on the, the music or audio side you know there are lots of places for directors and cinematographers and so forth but um, so I really just had to learn everything by just doing it myself and watching other people and reaching out to, you know, mentors that I know to kind of help me out. Um, and uh, so I, I, I feel like I need to pivot back to film scoring and then I just start collecting libraries. And if you if um, um, a lot of you are familiar, if you're if you're doing some of this kind of work, is that it's really expensive. <laughs> it's like, you know, I think I've chosen one of the most expensive fields to go into because every piece of equipment is expensive. You know, software is expensive. Mics are expensive. And uh, and you just kind of need all that stuff to to kind of, you know, uh, make polished and professional sounding stuff. Um, and uh, and that, about this time, I've known Luke. So Luke and I have become friends because he was living in Columbus at the time. And uh, so um, uh, I just had to throw that in there, Luke. Um, and uh, so I was there at Capital, and I guess about four years ago, uh, actually maybe about 2014, um, my current mentor, his name's Larry Groupe. Um, he's a composer. He's a composer for The Outpost, the, the war movie that I just worked on. And uh, he had just, he came to do a talk at Capitol and it was on like, you know, Hollywood film scoring. And I was like, <laughs> sign me up. I'll be right there. Um, so, you know, we invite him in. I was on faculty at the time and he kind of does his talk and he's like, you know, and it's just amazing because, you know, as I've kind of been describing, I've been this like kind of Bermuda Triangle of, of film music and uh, post-production audio because there isn't, there aren't the, um, like, uh, the middle class, you know, the backbone of the industry that we have, like, here in L.A. and some other kind of, you know, cities, which you need in order for that work to, to, to be viable there, right? Um, so like in Columbus or Cincinnati, Cleveland, we, they, they do a lot of film shoots, you know, big Marvel movies are, are shot there, but all that work goes back to LA or it goes to Atlanta or some other place where, you know, the middle class, those, those craftsmen work. Um, but, uh, so Larry Goupe comes and he's like, Hey, I'm starting this film scoring workshop. I was like, sign me up. And, uh, so I go out there and, uh, and it's amazing. This is one week, kind of like 10 day intensive thing. And, uh, and I, I kind of like jump in right away because they need help too. So 
by the end of it, you know, I'm already like going up to the studio with the other music editor, kind of helping out and, uh, and really just kind of making myself available, right? And saying, what can I do to solve the problems that you have? You know, not, you know, hey, Larry, how can you, how can you do something, do me a favor and get me in the industry? But it's, you know, to all of these, you know, professionals that I had the opportunity to work with there, um, what can I do? You know, tell me how I can help you out. And, uh, and that is really, um, you would be surprised how uh, that's like kind of a, a turnkey, you know, to unlocking or connecting with people, especially in, in, the, in the music industry, which is such a networking, you know, um, uh, relationship, you know, person to person um, kind, of, uh, kind of field. And uh, uh, so I basically, you know, after I leave, I'm just like, I'm devastated when I go, right? Because I'm going back to Columbus and it's like, I want to do this. I've like seen, LA, you know, I've seen the West Coast and, uh, and got, you know, another, you know, uh, foot closer to kind of what I've always wanted to do. Um, so I basically started making plans. I went back, you know, the next year and I was like, I volunteered to be an intern, you know, and I was 30, I don't even know how old I was, you know, I'm not even that, I was like 40 at the time. And it's like, I will be your intern. And so I went out there and I interned and I busted my butt, you know, and, uh, and then they fired their music editor and hired me <laughs> by the end of that. So third year, I'm the music editor there. And, uh, and now we're into our sixth year or whatever. And, you know, my, uh, my relationship with Larry Coupe, the composer, you know, he's my mentor now. And when I first met, you know, after all this was going on, oh, through all this was going on, it's like, you're going to be my mentor. You might not know it now, but you're going to be just kind of jumping on his back and, uh, you know, and, and just going with it. Um, so, uh, and through those connections, you know, so I moved to, uh, I think I've moved out here, what, uh, Luke, like four years ago when we moved out to LA. So it took me about three years to, um, to make that decision, it's like, okay, I gotta get out of here. You know, um, I'm, my, my career's ending in Columbus. I have nowhere to go, basically. Um, I have no room to go in Capitol where I was teaching. Uh, so, you know, I just gotta make this change, uh, make this move. And we did it and it was super painful. Um, and uh, it was very hard because, you know, I, it's always one of those where you think you're gonna get work faster than you do. And it's, you know, I've been here three years now and now I'm just getting like, you know, constant work, even during COVID now, where it's like, now I'm so busy that, you know, I have to, I have my own intern now, which is amazing. Um, uh, anyway, so that's, that's kind of my story, how I got here. Um, and, you know, one of the takeaways, at least for this, hopefully for the students, uh, is um, that there are so many paths that you can go down uh, for your field, um, or for your, you know, the thing that you're passionate about. And at the time you might not know that that's the right decision. Uh, and it, you might think it's this really circuitous route, you know, where you're, 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 you're leaving your path and you're, you're going off and doing something that's not related to, you know, what, what you, you think you want to do or where you think you're going to be, you know, five or 10 years from now. Um, and when I look back now and like all through all the weird, you know, even like flower arranging stuff that I did uh, and painting murals and, um, uh, and all these little side, weird audio side jobs, doing the, all the tech stuff is that, you know, it's all come together. Um, Cause you know, I had, uh, I, I have experience at the film score and my Pro Tools chops are really good. And, and I know the drama now about, so I can be a music editor. So all of these things kind of come together, um, all these little, you know, lessons learned. And then, then you realize, you know, hopefully you'll realize, you know, when you get to that point where it's like, oh, I don't regret anything that happened, you know, because that's what got me here. And now I have all these skills that are, you know, I can bring to the table, um, you know, for, for music editing or for, for film scoring, <clears throat> which we'll kind of talk about more here in a second um, and get into that. But, uh, but there you go. That's kind of like my, my route in a nutshell, how I got here. Hopefully there's some, you know, some takeaways for, for the up and coming professionals um, in the room. Um, hopefully, awesome. have any, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Luke? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before you uh, give us some walkthroughs yeah. and mm -hmm. examples, um, because that's the will be the more exciting. Oh yeah, all right. I'm going to stop talking. Uh, no, no. Actually, I'm very thankful that you from outside, so that they don't hear it from us. That yeah. you may go in many different trajectories. Oh, oh my gosh, yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the crucial thing is that you just take them and you keep building on them, 
and a little bit gets you this bit closer. You might have to go over here for a little while, but all of those things will add in a lot of depth to what when you do arrive. So absolutely, yeah. It's like you just have to keep your eye on the prize, you know. Because uh, even when I was like just, I didn't. There, you know, a point when I first moved to Tokyo, I didn't do audio for like a year, and uh, so. But that was, you know, that was okay because I knew I was working to a, a spot where. You know, I could do this, and and I also knew that even like the random things that I was doing, that you know, that would come together hopefully. You know, and uh, so you just got to trust your instincts and hope, but ho and hopefully, you know, your inner instincts are good, and they're not going to totally, you know, take you off in the wrong direction. But uh, you know, as long as you have kind of a support group, uh, you know, and and do the networking and stuff like that, you know, hopefully there will be a lot of people all, all along the way who are going to be going like, no, that's the way you want to go. Don't go down that way. Go that way. Um, and hopefully, you know, you'll uh, you you'll have people you can trust and to help you guide you right through all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I can't say enough. Um, let me just talk about the networking thing because uh, before I kind of play some examples and stuff, talk about you know how I deal with like narrative sound. Um, Networking is so important um, if you're thinking about the music field, um, especially the film industry, post-production audio um, storytelling. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's that personal connection um, that, and, you know, COVID's making it hard right now, but uh, um, you just have to, you know, uh, I, I get so many, you know, uh, young people will, will email me, you know, not even on my students, but others that I know, you know, how do I get a job? What am I supposed to do? You know, and I just tell them, you just got to start reaching out to people, you know, um, make a list of like, you know, the, the 10, um, you know, maybe you don't know anyone in LA right now and you want to go out there. Um, and you want to work in the film industry, uh, in music or whatever, um, you know, make your, your, your top 10 list of the top movies, that 10 movies that you like, and then find those, find those professionals who are working on those. Um, maybe there's like, you love the sound of, you know, a Jurassic park or something like that. Um, so you find the person and then you send them an email <laughs> and you really do. There's a lot of cold emails that you have to do. And, uh, in a couple of sentence, you know, um, I'm a big fan of yours. I, and you know, you got to make it specific, you know, I love this thing that you did in this movie at this point in time, you know, that was amazing. You know, I'm an up and coming, blah, blah, blah. You know, when I'm out in LA, it'd be, it'd be awesome if, you know, I could pick your brain over coffee, whatever. And, uh, and then there you go. And, um, and you would be surprised, uh, you know, how many, you know, uh, yeses that you will get, you know, so if you send out 10 of those, you might get one person to say yes. And that's still a good, you know, a, a good ratio. Um, and then you go meet that person and they might not have anything for you, but they're going to like, be like, oh yeah, you know, this person's cool, you know, um, why don't you go talk to my friend Luke? You know, he has, I think he's working on a project. And that's how it just kind of snowballs and, and start, you start making these connections. Um, and, you know, you might not, you know, you might have to send a hundred of those out and you might get two or three replies. But, you know, for me, the way I look at it is I'm expecting the no's. So if I get 99 no's, I'm like, that's, you know, you got to think about that. That's a good day um, because you're still reaching out and you're trying. Um, and it's just, you just, and you just chip away at it and you start building those relationships. And, uh, and it's all about trust in my industry. It's like because we have so much on the line and it's such a team sport, you know, if I mess something up, then everybody that comes after me is going to suffer for it. Um, so it's it's like, you know, once you get vetted by somebody like I started doing some projects and bigger projects um, like Child's Play 2. Um, and then it's like, oh, you know, Jason LaRocca, that engineer, he's vetted you. Um, so now I can just call somebody up and they're gonna like, oh, yeah, you work with Jason. He's awesome. He's super detailed. You're good now. So those are the kind of little steps that you take, you know, to, to go out there. But you just have to get out there and start meeting people, you know, and uh, and just hounding the pavement and buying people coffee. And uh, and, and, you know, so you got to be humble. You have to be, you know, outgoing uh, so much as you can. You know, a lot of us artists and designers, musicians, we're introverts. And uh, and I was a super introvert when I was younger. Um, and you just learn how to, you know, to, to come to get past that. And every win that you have, you have successful coffee date, you know, that's just another like, you know, um, uh, just kind of uh, another armor that you can put on, right? Um, that it's like, yeah, I can do that. And it just kind of snowballs from there, you know? Um, so yeah, students out there who are listening, just, you know, make those contacts, make those relationships. It's all about networking and it's a networking effect, right? So it's like, the more you do it, you know, the more it will just cascade and build on itself. Um, 
so yeah, hopefully that's inspirational for some for some out there. Yeah, <laughs> Stephen, I have a I have a quick question. Sure. It's been a fascinating story so far. I'm curious. You said you you are saying yes to all these opportunities as they as they come up. Was there ever a point where there was an opportunity where you you really you had to say you had or you, you decided it was appro appropriate to say no mm -hmm. and in retrospect that was really important to to not go down that path to you know and to get where you were ultimately wanting to be yeah um i'm trying to think um uh, not any like major ones come to mind it's like now that you know i think you know, when you're starting out, it really is, you know, you don't say no, you take every gig, you know, watch YouTube videos, like, I know how to do that, <laughs> you know, and then you go home and Google it and you try to figure it out for the next day. Um, and recently, just because of getting more busier, you know, and then, you know, there were, I would say a lot of projects, and they're all, they don't all work out, where you took that project because it was like, you know, it was my first gig, like here in LA, and um, and then you you just realize it's bad, you know, it's like there's no budget, and now they're, you know, asking you to do more, and you're, you're volunteering to do more too, it's like, yeah, I can do that, you know, um, and it just kind of just, you know, just self-destructs, you know, so, the, oh, you know, so, uh, yeah, obviously there's those examples. I don't have any like very specific ones. Um, yeah. I guess, it, I guess it's hard to know in retrospect either. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, there are definitely some projects I've taken where it's just like, I wish I wouldn't have taken that project because mm -hmm. I would have rather have kept my relationship with this composer, um, uh, on a different level, you know, because I, I know them and, uh, um, like some, I had worked as a colleague before, you know, um, and then, you know, and so sometimes it's better that you don't work with certain people, you know, and you, that's, and that's one of those things you just kind of figure out, um, by trial and error, I guess. And then, you know, and as hopefully you have a good sense, uh, for people, you know, and, uh, and, you know, but yeah, you're definitely going to get burned. But, you know, when I do, you know, uh, of course you're frustrated, you know, but you just kind of like, you know, try to just put in perspective and be like, that's another thing I just learned. I learned not to do that. Or I, I've learned to read those signs, right? Where there were like flashing red signs going on. I was like, no, I'm not looking at any of that because I want to do this project. It's really cool. Or I think it's cool. And then you realize when you get into it, it's just like, ooh, yeah, this is, this is a big world hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, Luke. Um, so, oh, that's, uh, yeah, so, you know, I was uh, talking with Robert before we joined. It's like, you know, I, I named this uh, talk working in working in sound. Um, and, you know, part of that because I knew, you know, a lot, we have a lot of students and, you know, and it's a big, back, big black box, right, for everybody in all of our fields. It's like, you know, even if you're super talented, you don't know how to do it until you see someone do it. Or then you're like, oh, I can do that, you know, but until you, like, see the workflow and all of that it's really hard um but my really the angle i wanted to come out today was storytelling um because you know you guys are doing sound there you know um but a lot of it uh at least from my understanding is kind of coming from the science part of it you know it's like you know sound for ecology so a lot of this is going to be you know preservation and archival um or you know uh, uh activist or climate or you know so there's it's the whole kind of different angle from where I come from, where I'm being paid to like make sound and tell a story and be narrative about it. Right. Um, so that's, uh, and that's, that's my, what I really teach at IU. It's like, I work with, um, our composers and I teach them tech, but I'm also teaching them about the, the drama of sound and how sound acts as a narrative element in the movies we watch or, or anything, even if you, you know, uh, um, you, I know you guys make a lot of like, you know, architecture kind of fly through, you know, stuff um, and you have, you know, different demos in order to show off designs and so forth. And all of those, too, you know, a lot of those need need audio and they need sound. It's like, what kind of sound do you put on that you know stuff? Um, you can't just drop a song in there, you know, and some people do. Um, and it just doesn't work, you know, because it's like there's no connection to to a story of like what you want to tell. Right. Um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about today and show some examples. Um, and, uh, and hopefully by the end of this, you're never going to watch a movie the same way again, <clears throat> because you're going to start thinking about, you know, cause music, uh, you know, if it's a good score, um, it just falls into the background. Right. And we're really s s sucked into like the movie itself. And, uh, and then later on we might realize, oh, oh my God, there was a lot of music there. It was really cool. 
um, you know, it's a very passive kind of listening what we do, um, you know, because we're focused on the dialogue and then usually then the sound effects and then the music hopefully isn't taking such center stage is that it's calling attention to itself. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so film scoring or composing for picture is a whole nother world than composing for like the concert stage or composing um, for art's sake, right? Um, because the music that and sound that we do is, uh, it's a, um, you know, it's a product, right? It's a product and we're on a big team. And my, my, my goal as, or my job as a music editor or a film composer, um, music editor especially, is to kind of wrangle all that sound together, um, the music side, and, uh, and then put that into the movie. Um, and hopefully, uh, I've been working with the composer, or if I'm the composer that, you know, we've written something that's going to enhance the film, that's gonna help tell the story of that film. Um, because sound and music is very interesting. You can't pause sound, right? You can't like, like you can put a piece of art on the wall or, or pause a pause a film and look at the and look at that frame. Sound is, you know, um, is constant, you know, and it's tied to time. So there's there's no way for us to kind of just like stop, you know, a piece of music and absorb it. Right. Um, uh, we have other kind of weird techniques uh, in the audio world, like um, uh, oh, I'm losing the word now. Um, anyway, we can freeze time with audio, but this is not what I'm talking about. Um, so it's such a different medium. And in, in sound for picture, sound and music, music especially, is the emotional element. Music is what gives us the emotion of a film. You know, picture can't do that. Um, it can give us a sense of time and place. Um, you might have colors that can give you some mood, um, but music is really kind of the emotional element of film. Um, and, uh, and then sound also plays a critical role in that, you know, is, uh, is the door slam hard or is it, you know, if someone slams the door that has totally different meaning than if someone closes the door. Right. Um, or if a door shuts and it's a very kind of small sound versus a huge sound, you know? Um, so here's how we, we use, um, we use the drama and the emotional element of music and sound to kind of pull your heartstrings and tell you how to feel. Um, and hopefully if we're doing a good job at it, you don't know what's going on, right? And uh, so that's kind of the role of music. Um, so let me see here if I have some, uh, some examples here. Um, ah, let me just play a couple here. So one of the, my first projects I worked on was, uh, was this little kind of unknown series called Veggie Tales. Um, that you guys might have heard about. Um, so let me just play a couple of cues from that. And uh, animation might be kind of a good thing to start with here. Um, okay. And uh, so this was my first feature film that I did. And I worked on it at Capital University, believe it or not. That's where I got this job. One of our professors had we used to work in New York and, you know, back in the day and did jingles for like Candyland and all these games or whatever. And, uh, you know, work with all these R and B grades and he's actually teaching there at Capitol now. And, uh, so he gets this call and he's like, you know, Hey, we got this film and we're working with, um, a guitar player in New York, um, uh, named John, uh, John Curry. And he's actually the guitar player who played on Cindy Lauper's kind of big hit, big album back in the day. Um, so he he gets this gig but he's not a tech guy you know he doesn't he's never he's not in this new world of like libraries and and midi demos and all of that so he asks around and you know i'm the only one on faculty who really can do that so i get the call and he's like hey you want to collaborate on this veggie tales film and that was my first film score in columbus at capital university so it's like you just never know where opportunities are going to come from so kind of going back to our first thing, as long as you, you just got to be prepared, right? So even if you're on your little tangent going off your path, you think you're going off your path, as long as you're you're still honing your skills, you know, you're kind of preparing yourself. So when that opportunity does come, you're going to be ready for it. You're going to be able to see it. And a lot of, and that's usually what happens is like, we're not ready. So we don't even see the opportunity when it presents our, it, it, to ourselves. Um, okay, so let me just play you a couple of little quick clips here from VeggieTales. Let me share you my screen and, uh, Let's see here. Um, where is, ah, here we go. Okay. Can you guys see that? It's like a little 
Chinese restaurant or something we're in. Um, okay, so this is uh, up, the music up until this point is kind of like the, we, you know, we're collaborating with, uh, there's a kind of a rock composer who's doing all the guitar and kind of Seinfeldy stuff. And then after this part is where I kick in. So my job for this film was basically writing all the music for this evil little onion here. <laughs> so my, uh, my collaborator, he got all the more touchy feely kind of stuff, uh, very emotional touching moments. And I got all the big action, you know, kind of dramatic cues. Um, so, uh, so here's the, here it is. And here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I can do this. We should go. You've come back to put the band back together. Okay, I'm in. Visiting some old friends? Yeah. Uh, sorry, who are you? Just a fan of the Groovy Brothers. Until they broke up. You guys never could get along, could you? It was a long time ago. What makes you think they're gonna forgive you now? After you left them behind? I'm, I'm sure they've forgotten about all that. <laughs> Have you? Grandpa, are you coming? Yeah, wait up. Okay, uh, here's another cue. Hopefully you guys can see this in the same window without uh, me switching. Uh, oh, no, it looks like I'm going to have to reshare the screen again. Okay, here we go. Um, so that one, you know, you could see like uh, animation. You, there's a lot of what we call Mickey Mousing that goes along. So it's like every time the onion, you know, is bouncing around, we have this marimba that's the kind of following him around. So it's a lot of like, you know, something happens, a little sound happens. And it's, it's so animation's really, really hard to do. And it takes a lot of time. I'd rather do a drama than animation, definitely. Uh, so here's another one. And notice that it's not very finished. Right. It's like kind of wireframed a lot of this, you know, the, all the colors are still kind of messed up. Um, uh, actually, hold on. if I share my screen with you, you'd be able to see that. OK, here we go. So here's this. Uh, so this one looks very different. So this is this is kind of like how we receive stuff. Sometimes for animation, we might only get like a, a, a kind of like a painting of something. And it's like this is the vibe. They haven't even animated it yet or they're going to use that music to animate the stuff. So, you know, uh, as I'm writing music or as we're creating the sound, you know, all the other departments are creating the graphics and so forth. And then slowly as we go along, we'll get new material and start seeing kind of, you know, a finished product starting to, to perform. But here's another one. This is where uh, our evil onion kind of reveals his nasty plot. And, uh, and Junior over here kind of overhears what's going on. There you go. Lanny was all, we were best friends. Dennis was all, yeah, we were. <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> snap is right. Snap like a snap, Pete. Snap like a rubber band. <laughs> here's Lanny, here's Dennis, here's their friendship. Snap! <laughs> I scream for everybody. One more day. One more day and the park is all mine. The only songs we're ever going to hear from the Groovy Brothers are on the radio. A radio from 30 years ago. <laughs> it's payback time. And it tastes as good as a popsicle on a sunny day. What are you gonna do to that band, boss? Same thing I'm doing to this pop. I'm okay, and then it just goes into this big rock song that another composer wrote. Um, okay, so you know, you kind of, uh, it's just like you know, something happens. We like you know, do a chord or you know. So uh, interesting, a uh, very different how we approach film music and uh, and TV or you know, just music for picture um, versus like. A concert, you know, or whatever is that, you know, we have we have the picture to deal with. And um, so there might be a lot of shifts that happen within a, a, a span of a second. You know, we might go through two or three different emotions. You know, maybe it's um, the actor looks, you know, then we cut to the other actor who's happy. And then we go back to the other one who's sad. And uh, and we'll all we'll do all these little micro shifts within the music. Um, maybe go from major to minor really quick. Um, and uh, just to kind of like, you know, lead the the, the viewer and give the, the the emotional part of what the actor or what's happening on scene that's not being communicated through dialogue or just kind of like their their hand or eye movements and so forth. Um, okay, so there's some animation stuff. Um, let me let's see here. Um, oh, okay. Um, let's just let me show you. I'll play some of this. Oh, okay. Let's do this um, here. Uh, Okay, let me uh, open this up here. Let's see, preview, preview. Okay, 
hang on a second, guys. I'm like, uh, okay. So another thing that I do, um, and this will lead us kind of in another piece, is um, a lot of uh, a field recording or collecting of sounds. Um, and uh, so, and this kind of, you know, for this, there's like sound ecology stuff that's kind of related to this, right? Um, so one of the ways that we use field recording in film scoring um, might be to, to take sounds and then to manipulate them into something else. Um, or uh, if I'm doing sound design for a film, it might be, you know, going and recording, you know, it's a scene that's a city. So I'll go out and record the city, you know, and put that in. Um, so sound design also acts like, a, you know, as, as realism. So we can put you in a certain time or place, you know, maybe there's birds, maybe it's a barking dog that's down the street. All those little decisions that we make to kind of tell a story and like flesh out, you know, where we are in environment. And the more, the more layers of sound and, and, uh, and nuance of sound that we have, we can build these really rich environments. Um, and that within a few seconds, the listener can, or the viewer, can understand where they are, you know, are we in the future? Are we in the past? Are we in an urban environment or rural environment? Um, is it scary, you know, uh, you know, or is it lively? You know, if we have a neighborhood that's just super quiet with crickets and I can put a little string, you know, note on there, I can make that really scary. Or, you know, I can add some kids laughing and then suddenly I can make that happy, you know, with the same location. Um, okay, uh, so, um, so here, let me show you some field recording stuff. Um, so uh, this is, uh, these are contact mics. Um, hopefully you guys can see that um, on the screen, okay? And uh, what contact mics are are very different than regular mics. So contact mics actually record sound through vibrations. So we actually put these on, you know, um, surfaces and we can record them. We can even put them in ice, uh, in boiling water. We can put them in like tree trunks and underground and record, you know, uh, ants or, you know, critters moving around. Uh, so what I did for this um, is basically we had this old piano um, at the studio that I worked with and it just creaked and, and kind of groaned and no matter what you did, you lifted the piano up. So I was like, oh, this will be a good thing to record. So you can see how the contact mics are kind of attached to Okay, that uh, um, to the, the hardware of the piano. So let me show you now. Um, let me show you another screen. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, um, so a lot of you guys are, are, are kind of hip to spectrograms. Okay, let me just zoom in a little bit. Okay, so this is just all creaking of the pedal of the wood frame. Let me jump to a good spot. So I recorded about, I don't know, 30 minutes of this. You know, it's just going, doing all kind of stuff, you know, like putting my hand on the piano, playing rhythms on the piano. And uh, it's really just a sound harvesting, you know, kind of session that I did here. What software are you using so, here? Um, this is called RX. This is a company, Isotope, makes this. And this is um, really restoration kind of cleanup software. Uh, and it's amazing. So if I record a, I just was taking out coughs and coughs from a concert recording, you know, some just, you know, huge you know, guys coughing. And I, I can remove that stuff now. This is like Photoshop for audio, basically, is what this is, Luke. Um, so it's amazing. It's amazing. So we can do so much with it. Um, I can clean up all kinds of audio now. Um, so, so what I did, I took that, that recording I did, and I kind of found some cool parts that I liked. And then I put it in a convolution reverb. And that's basically a reverb that's sampled and it's like can recreate kind of real spaces. And this one, uh, this recreation, I think is like, it's called gasometer and it's this um, natural gas kind of dome that's in, uh, in the old Soviet Union somewhere. Um, and, uh, and somebody captured a reverb of it. And it's like 29 seconds of reverb basically is what this is. Um, so we use convolution reverb to kind of put sound in a space and then we could create another space. Um, so let me just play a little bit of this. Here's some rhythmic stuff, I think. Let me jump over here.
Okay, so you kind of get the idea. So my goal, once I did that, I was like, oh, you know, what does this sound like? Um, to me, this sounds like space. You know, it sounds like a void, um, uh, you know, just kind of black hole or something. Um, so I was working on a game at the time. So I was like, oh, this is going to be the backdrop for my game, basically. Um, so let me just kind of play this. So this is for like a kind of younger person's action. You know, this is a sci-fi thing. So I'll play this and uh, I might just jump around because I know we're running out of time. Um, So all of this here is that creaky piano that I recorded, basically. With some synths. some of the differences and some of the similarities you've seen between film scoring and uh, sounding and, you know, scoring for, for games. Yeah. You know, it's very similar in a lot of ways because, you know, we're still talking about drama. We're talking about picture. Um, and it's more of a workflow issue with games um, because with games, we don't have a start and an end, right? That's where it's so different than picture. So you have to compose and design your sound for these game engines that will like Weiss or FMOD or Unity Engine, who will you will basically drop in these sounds uh, or pieces of music, you know, sound effects, um, and the game engine will basically decide when that stuff needs to play back, you know. So you know, so say if you're like in some Lord of the Rings game, you know, you're just in the field in the valley, nothing's happening, you know, it might be just like really low low level kind of music, right? That's just kind of ambient. And then, you know, the orc comes over the hill and suddenly we notch the tension up. So we add another layer of music that might add some rhythm, rhythm to it, uh, just to start adding more tension. And then it gets closer and then we, you know, uh, and then the fight breaks out and then a whole nother layer of music will come in. And uh, so it's just the way you compose it. Uh, it's, it's all the same kind of principles, you know, of, um, of storytelling. But uh, it's just how it's implemented is is really the big difference, um, and the pay. <laughs> you get paid a lot more money for games than you do for uh, for films, which is crazy. Yeah, and you have more time to do them usually. So that's kind of the biggest uh, the biggest thing there. Um, okay, so let me just kind of skip this one. Uh, we'll jump to something else here. Um, okay, here's another kind of cool example. So here's some more other field recording stuff that, uh, that I do. So I was out in, um, Bloomington, Indiana, and there's this place called Lake Monroe. So I just recorded, you know, I just recorded some birds is what I was doing, uh, recording some water and birds. Okay. So there we go, they have some birds. Now what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of isolate those birds. So this is like kind of the next part of doing that. So I basically kind of removed all the water, all the air and all the wind and really just isolated. Um, there's actually a, a, a plugin out there now called D-Bird that will actually kind of automate this process, which is super important for us sound designers or whatever. Think of Walking Dead, right? Um, you know, it's out in the middle of the forest in, in Atlanta or whatever, and you can't have any kind of sounds. You know, most of the animals are dead at this point in time, you know, no technology. So we use a program like RX to be able to basically remove audio, isolate audio and so forth. Um, so then what I did is I, I'm really into kind of like 
pitch shifting and time stretching and kind of like ripping sounds apart and stretching them out and kind of, you know, going on a gold mine, um, uh, mining, mining for sounds basically. So this is kind of what, uh, what that turned into after kind of several kind of layers of processing. Pretty neat, huh? <laughs> so there you go. It's instant kind of like a uh, Twilight Zone or whatever. It's almost like a theremin. Um, so a lot, a lot of this, you know, happens. Um, I did a lot of this kind of in the, for the outpost too, um, where we had to create these huge transitions or whatever. So it's like grabbing another piece of audio that the composer wrote and then manipulating that and turning and turning it into something else. Um, okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, so I did a little video of that. Let me stop. Let me share on the screen here real quick. So I took that piece and uh, let me just play a little bit of it real quick here. Okay. And let me share this with you. Okay. Uh, okay. So this was, I was still at Lake Monroe. And as we were walking back, there was this leaf that was hanging by a thread by the, on a spider web. And it was just kind of blowing around. Um, so I like took that, I, I stopped and took a video of that in slow motion. And then through this crazy, you know, uh, stretched out lead, uh, birds thing on it. Let me jump a little further and it might be a little louder. There you go. Okay, so you kind of get the idea. <laughs> so you you know it's so you know I think you know in, to be in this field uh, you just have to have a really strong passion for audio and just experimenting all the time because um, you know what's going to set you apart, especially if you're a film composer, is your originality, right? Everybody has access to the same tools and libraries nowadays, so it's like what can you do to make that you know something special that no one else could create and that's the, you know usually what kind of directors are, are, are looking for um okay i know we're kind of getting close to time right uh so last uh maybe thing i'll show you guys is that i wanted to talk about um kind of film for a little bit um i would have loved to uh to show you guys some outpost or um you know, Tesla or anything like that, but I can't, I'm gonna get so in trouble with the studio. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, and uh, I'm actually doing another, um, right now I'm working on another movie uh, that's up and coming. It's called Jolt uh, and it's with Kate Beckinsale. And uh, so I'm temping this right now. So what that is, is that before we hire a composer, um, we still have to put mu music, you know, into the film because, you know, producers have to see it. The director has to see it. There's a lot of people that have to sign off on the cut, you know, the feel of it. You know, is this the right motion for this person? You know, sometimes even the actors um, will need to. Uh, so um, so basically my, my role as a as a as as a temp temping kind of music editor is just to pull you know so i watch the movie i'm like trying to understand you know what the connection is in the scene and then i'm pulling movie from uh music from other movies and then editing that in you know into the to the film and that kind of sets the kind of the foundation or the flavor you know for for you know the rest of uh the music and uh and then a composer will get hired and they'll have that that temp as a guide you know, to um, to kind of steer them, you know, in the right direction, because this has already been signed off by the directors and everything. This is the kind of vibe that they want. So, you know, so this is what we call temp love a lot of times, too, where the composer has to fight against the temp that's in there. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I'm doing right now as a music editor. OK, so let me show you this session real quick. Oh, hang on a minute. Uh, that's not going to be all the right. Uh, I'm going to have to show you my whole session on my whole screen, unfortunately. Um, Okay, let me just stretch this out just a little bit more. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so this is a program called Digital Performer. And this is like any other uh, D 
DAW that, um, that you might have. Okay. Like Pro Tools, Logic, or whatever. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about film. So this is a short film called um, uh, Revenge Inc. And the, the premise of the story is that there's this company that you can hire to exact revenge on whoever, you know, some of it's petty, you know, oh, some guy kicked my dog, you know, I need you to go punch him in the face. Uh, and other stuff is more serious. It's like, you know, this person killed somebody and I want you to, you know, to go return the favor. Um, so it's this kind of uh, dystopic, I don't know, maybe this is utopic, who knows, um, kind of alternate, you know, reality. So it still looks like it's in present time. Everything looks the same. So it's just kind of a kind of a crazy story. Um, and uh, so let's talk about the sound about this a little bit. So actually on this, this pro project, I was actually the re-recording mixer too, which is a, a re-recording mixer is the one that actually mixes the dialogue and everything together. So I also wrote the music, but so for a lot of short films like this, you might have one person who does all the sound. And this is kind of what I did for this film. Um, okay, so I have uh, three tracks here. So this is my dialogue track, uh, which we abbreviate DX. You'll see that a lot. Here's my effects mix, and then here's my music down here, okay? So I'm just gonna play the scene with, uh, with just the dialogue. And uh, so at this point in time, we have two characters. She's the one who works for Revenge Inc. And then Marty here, her name's Marty. She's going to go see Meredith to basically hire the company to, you know, um, uh, get revenge because her daughter was killed in a car accident. Um, so, so this is, um, she basically, she's got to the location and she's going into the building for the first time. And, uh, so my thought with, and these are kind of the deep discussions that we have with the director is that, okay, so she's going into this building. This is like her going into hell basically, right. Or going into, you know, it's almost like a level in a game because she's making this decision to, you know, uh, to go through with this thing. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the emotion that I'm trying to get, um, with the sound effects and so forth. So here's just the dialogue, uh, just this, this is the dialogue track. So this is kind of the track that's recorded on set basically with a miss, you know, the sound design isn't added yet. Okay. So here we go. Okay. Okay, so it's pretty simple, right? She gets in the elevator, she's kind of waiting for the elevator. Still standing there. Okay, so now we have our photo of her daughter. So this is a key moment in the scene, obviously. Okay. Marty? You have an appointment? Yes, are you Meredith? I am. Follow me. Okay. Um, so the real backstory is that Meredith is the one who killed her daughter. So this is the twist at the end, basically. Um, so here, this brings up another point that what we do a lot for sound. So I, like I showed you guys those animations before. That's what we call a lot of linear writing, where we're like, an action happens, I'm writing it, you know, boom, here's another action, another thing happens, another thing happens, and we're kind of Mickey Mousing the whole way. Um, and this is being put together in more of a linear fashion, where a lot of times film scores will be writing for not what's happening right now, but what's happening five minutes from now, or what's going to happen 30 minutes from now in the film. So while you're watching it, you might not understand why there this certain emotion is happening, you know, but when we get to the twist at the end of the movie, suddenly you're like, ah, oh my God, that's why this was going on. So those are the kind of elements that we want to talk about when we're doing this. So as you know, I have these talks with the director and we talk about you know, okay, this is, you know, I'm thinking this, she's kind of going into hell. She's going into her, the next level of the game because this is the person that she's going to murder, you know? Um, so she's actually going to, you know, kill her. So she's kind of getting herself psyched up for this. Um, so here's the, now with the sound design added. So before it was like the elevator closed. There's hardly made any noise, right? She's in the elevator. It's just very quiet. So it's a very boring shot to, to watch. Um, but so what, what the sound is going to do is basically put us into that environment and hopefully put us into her head, right? And this is what we call POV, point of view. Um, so we want to get into the head of, of, uh, of our character. Okay. So block deeper, door closed there.
Okay, so here you can hear little creaks of the elevator moving now. Just little random things that's going to make it more realistic. And then a big reveal on the door. Marty? Okay. So what the sound design is doing there is just kind of putting us in the place, right? And it's just kind of fleshing out everything. It's the creaky elevator, you know. Um, so there's all these kind of ambient sounds that we're using to basically describe the place a little bit more. Um, so now let's listen with, with music. Now, I don't know how you guys feel about this so far. It's just kind of like, hmm, it's kind of boring, right? She's just getting in the elevator. What is she doing? Um, so let's add some music now. And hopefully this is going to add the emotional element to, um, to the scene. Okay. There we go. Well, here we go. Here's music. Okay. Thank you. Marty? Do you have an appointment? Yes. Are you Meredith? I am. Follow me. Okay. Um, so it's totally a different feel, right? Uh, and, you know, so we have like this ticking kind of pacing, that, and that's a very, it's a really cool technique and tool or device that we can use to kind of like give you the passing of time, or the ticking clock is really supposed to be her nervousness, you know? And it, and it gives us a pace and it propels us through the scene. So this is a lot of what, of, of, of what music is going to do later on. We do a lot of fixing scenes when scenes don't cross together right or where there's bad acting and so forth. And uh, the director is going to rely on the film composer at the very end to basically tell us those emotions that, aren't, that we can't get through their acting or we can't get through the space and so forth. Um, Okay, I know we're kind of, uh, are we past time? We're kind of running out of time, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so there you go. So, you know, what I hope, I, I wish I could have got to some a little bit more playing, but, um, you know, to for, uh, you know, to, to kind of think about sound, especially if you want to pursue, like, you know, music for picture or, or games, um, or even thinking about how you can implement sound or music into your architectural flybys or, you know, your proposals and stuff like that is that, you know, music has meaning and it has a very visceral effect on us. And, uh, the right music can totally make a scene or a product, right. Or an advertisement or your proposal, uh, peak or pitch for a new building. Um, but it also can ruin it at the same time, because if you put the wrong music in or the wrong sounds, then you're, you're not going to be connecting with the emotional element, you know, of what we're seeing on screen or on video or, or whatever. And, uh, so next time you guys go see a movie, uh, listen for the sound, listen for the music and, uh, and see if you can, you know, cause even sound design can be scary, right? It's like even the elevator, it can make it really quiet where it's just kind of not there, or I can make it really big. And, you know, the door closing can ship huge amounts of bass in order to kind of give us a sense of grandeur and weight. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so there we go. Um, there's my, uh, <laughs> there's my, uh, my music storytelling in a nutshell there, Luke. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. Are so, there any any questions out there that uh, you, any of our listeners would like to pose? Put it in the chat, or we'll keep it on for a few more minutes. Because okay. Yeah, we can talk. Us. Um, you yeah. guys have any questions, or <laughs> you guys can help out the students, the uh, faculty here can save the day. Yeah. Um, I was just curious um, how the how you begin to, or where, where do you even start? When you oh, when you get a scene? Yeah. Um, you know what, you really, uh, um, and I've really learned a lot from my mentor, Larry Goupe. He um, and his, his longtime director that he works with, Rod Lurie, I've really learned a lot from him. And just being able to kind of um, distill down, you know, what, what is the, the core emotion of a scene? 
You know, like if we have a big, uh, like The Outpost, for example. I mean, it's a war movie. Yeah, it's an action movie, but it's not. It's about, it's a story about the relationship between these soldiers, right? And how they persevere through all of this hardship. And if you can hone in on that core, you know, um, so it's not like, oh yeah, it's an action movie about these guys running around in the mountains. Like that's what's happening, right? That's what's happening on screen. That's not what's happening, you know, like with the characters emotionally. Um, so if you can, if you can drill down into that and uh, whether that be kind of, you know, as I get a film and uh, like this one I'm temping now, it's like our goal was to like kind of make a love connection between these two characters because it's super important to the story later on. If we don't care about these characters, then nobody cares about the film. So it's like what kind of music and, and, and the editing also that we can, you know, all of these, you know, so the editor is going to work, you know, cutting together the cue in the right way and, and unfolding the story in the right way. And then the music will hopefully deliver the emotion of that, you know, so, cause you could have the same scene. I could put happy music or I could put sad music and then we'll, we'll feel totally different about the scene or I could put funny music on it. And suddenly now it's kind of a rom-com, you know, or I could put sad music and now it's a more serious drama. So it's all about um, understanding what the relationship is between the characters. And if you can nail that, um, you know, when we're talking about film or games or whatever, then hopefully that is going to set you off on the right path of, of kind of trying to getting the right sound. Um, now, how would that would apply to, you know, a lot of the design stuff that you guys do? You know, it might be the same thing where you're thinking about what's my what's my constituency? You know, what's the who's who am I marketing this to or, you know, what's the uh, what's the end goal? You know, and then you can kind of work from there as far as like, oh, it's like this demographic therefore this type of music you know in this era with these instruments might be you know the appropriate thing to to put you know as background music and uh and it takes time of course to kind of learn that you know as you you know the more you do you kind of learn your craft and then you, you kind of get you know more in tune to all this stuff but uh but that's what you know i would kind of recommend to up and coming you know filmmakers or designers you know whoever who are interested in implementing sound into their um into their work uh, and really thinking about it as a storytelling piece, right? Because that's how we connect with people um, and that's how we can move them to either tears or move them to action, right? Or, or move them to uh, buy something. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like, I don't want to talk about that, but, uh, but, um, but yeah, so that's what I would, I would kind of hone in on as far as like, that's what I look for. And it took me a long time to, to understand that. And I also look for the actors, what they're doing, you know, did they look up, you know, um, did they, did they do a side glance or all those little things are little details that are, 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 you know, stuff there to be mined. And there, we have so many cues that we're getting, you know, from the scene, does the camera move, you know, does the camera pan, you know, if that, then I might like try to do something that moves with the camera. Um, is there quick shots? Okay. I need something more fast paced, you know, is the scene dragging? I feel like, God, oh, this is so boring. Um, maybe we need to add something with a pulse. That's just kind of, kind of pick up the scene and pick up the tempo. Um, and this is why you see a lot of montage songs, right? Over, or, you know, the boxing, you know, like where the guy's like, okay, he's going to go into the gym. Now he's boxing, he's jumping rope and all that. And it's just like this montage song that's happening, right? To get us from one place to the other. So songs can do a lot of that too. But interesting, the songs can't provide emotion though for a scene. It can give you a vibe, but it can't tell us um, how to feel, you know, about a scene because it's just not it's not um it's not crafted for that scene right it's just this thing you're just dropping in on top of you know whatever um so so that's that's that's, that's a big pitfall i think a lot of young makers the filmmakers fall into is they just kind of paper their uh their movie with songs because they think that's going to be cool you know um with you know the latest flavor of whatever you know is on there um but it really is custom score and custom sound design that kind of delivers the emotion you know for the scene definitely um, does it take a very long to go through the process of scoring and deciding upon which scenes require music and what scenes require ambience? Yes, that's a super important thing. It's like when not to have music is just as important to when there is music. Um, because when you put music on stuff, then you're kind of forcing the scene sometimes. Um, so a lot of, uh, of the really good drama is when there isn't any music and you're just really relying on what the actors are doing to kind of connect you know, stuff together. And I think this is also a cultural thing as well. We're like filmmaking in the US, we, we tend to like, or especially like animations and Disney, if we think about that, it's wall to wall music, right? I mean, there's not hardly any 
si you know, silence um, where, you know, so they're constantly telling you how to feel. You know, it's like, oh yeah, guys riding the horse across this big galloping thing, you know, <laughs> and uh, and very different than like maybe like Miyazaki, right, a Japanese animator, um, who is more interested in sound design and 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 using sound to enrich what we're doing, and it takes a lot of time and money versus like just dropping a song into it or or a film score. So it takes a long time, you know, when you have a good cut from a film, it goes a lot faster because, you know, the whole story just kind of unfolds. And those are the best films because sometimes you're like, it doesn't need music. Why am I here? And now that's like, hopefully that you'll be able to work on some films like that. But yeah, what I usually do is just try to play it without, play it without music and then play it with, you know, and then see, you know, what you like. Um, and sometimes it's even just shifting music a one second back or one second earlier. Um, and suddenly the feel will, you know, will totally change, you know, as well. Um, so it takes a lot. Some, some scenes uh, go really quick and you're like, I got it, you know, here's the song or here's the vibe. Other ones, you know, it's in revision 17 where it's like, you know, back and forth. It's like, nope, this isn't right. This isn't right. On the outpost, there was one scene that I think we did like 17 revisions on. Um, and even on the dub stage, while we're mixing the film, you know, the director was like, you know, I don't like that music there find me something else. And then it's like my job to go scramble and be like, oh, okay, let's take this cue from this part of the movie and we can drop that in here, you know, and, and maybe I cut these two cues together. I can make a new one out of it. Um, so there's a lot of that that goes on till the last second, um, believe it or not. And, you know, think, thanks to our digital tools, which makes us not have to commit, you know, to anything anymore. I'm sure you guys suffer from that too, right? Where it's just like, you know, be, uh, kind of long for some of the analog days where you just had to make a decision and there you go, you know, but now we can like, we can save stuff to the last second before we, you know, we finally decide what to do. Yeah. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, or that question a little bit from, from Brandon. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it suffers. Okay, so cool. I think yeah. a lot of the examples you gave were very textural in nature. Um, whereas I know that in, in in some soundtracks, there's a lot of motifs mm. that get played mm. with different characters. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Do you have a preference or a uh, or or some kind of style guideline that you follow? Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's fun when I get a project where I can actually write kind of flourishing melodies. You know, and that happens a lot more in animation. You know, now. Um, uh, I think the trend now is to, to be more hybrid and more synthetic, where it's really kind of textural layers, where it's more of a vibe, right, um, than it is a, a motif or, or a melody, like John Williams, for example. Um, so those are the rare films now. And, you know, it, I don't know, I think it's a cyclic thing. You know, it's cyclical. And part of it is also the product of the tools that we have, right? Um, because it's linear and it's digital based and a lot of the programs that we use are very grid oriented and we can loop stuff. So, um, so that kind of uh, affects, you know, how the songwriting goes. And this is really um, true for kind of younger, you know, aspiring composers and, and sound designers um, where um, they might not have the chops yet to be able to, you know, make those melodies. Um, but it's just kind of not in total flavor right now you know it's more on the marvel huge lord of the rings kind of movies that you can get away with that although there's there's other ones out there like the shape of water or um you know more dramatic ones that you know alexander desplat and some other composers um uh, larry Groupe, for example very melodic although the movie that we just did the outpost is all synthetic you know it really is and it's more vibe and uh so i think it just depends on it depends on the film and it depends on the director um and uh and hopefully that kind of lines up with what you're good at, you know, um, but hopefully yet you'll, if you're, if you're serious about this, then you'll try to like hone your skills so that you can be able to write anything, you know, that you, you need to. Um, but yeah, to your point, a lot of less melody. You don't hear that much now, you know, nowadays it's kind of fallen out of, out of favor, but you know, it might come back, you know, Let's see. Yeah, definitely. Um, any other questions? So it's kind of closely related. Um, I wondered how, how typical it is to have this uh, this really subtle, you know, or bored line between sound effects yeah. and and the, the 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 musical score. I, I love the example of uh, you know that sound harvesting, constructing that video game environment. Yeah. That it was it was clearly it it, it was went right straight from one thing to the next. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, to that point, um, you know, the way the, 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 the Hollywood film industry is kind of built is there's lots, lots of silos. Um, and it's because there's just so many people involved and there's just so much. And it's just also just kind of like how it's been where it's like, you know, the sound team and the composer team, you might not ever meet. <laughs> you might not even ever talk to each other. And then, you know, there's sometimes there's lots of problems when everything comes together. Suddenly the sound doesn't work with the score or the score doesn't work with the sound. And now we have to start fixing stuff. Um, but there's also a very big push now. Like with smaller projects, like the one, like the short film I did, you know, um, I encourage my students to do because then you're, you know, there's, there's no pressure, right? These are, you know, kind of amateur films. Um, they're very low budget, you know, they're probably for, you know, a direct director to, to get something in his reel. And then that's everybody, right? Kind of like these 48 hour projects and all of that. Um, but, uh, and then you're going to be able to do all the sound, hopefully. But there's a, there's kind of a trend now too, or starting, there's a lot of vocal, vocal, you know, proponents who want to, merge those two together where it's like the the film composer and the sound it should be working hand in hand you know because especially now in these kind of hybrid scores and it's like is that sound design or is that music is there all these lines that are kind of blurred between the two um so i do try to encourage my you know uh young composers um to reach out to the sound people and vice versa you know the guys that i have doing sound um and make those relationships and get talking early hopefully because at least you can kind of like even if you're not really collaborating together um but at least you might be able to head off potential you know obstacles later on where maybe there's a train whistle um my mentor Larry Gupay uses this example a lot there's a train whistle and it has a very specific pitch but if you don't know it and you write it in the wrong key suddenly it's going to clash with your music you know so a lot of this little stuff like that that happens um but yeah you know here's where you know hopefully um this young you know new breed that is coming up and filmmakers alike um will start thinking about that ma mantra a little bit more of uh, more collaboration right between all the departments because it's such a it's a team sport and uh and i get it you know when working on really big projects that's just impossible because you know people are all over the world are in different time zones and everyone has their thing that they have to do and there's so much work you know to do but for smaller projects i think it's definitely you know definitely more doable um maybe in the game world there's a lot more collaboration you know because it's it's certainly a lot more kind of like melded together there's probably more collaboration between the two yeah but i'm a proponent definitely you know yeah i love it mm -hmm. absolutely yeah um, cool okay great well, i think you. we should probably close out thank you for joining us Stephen. and uh, thanks everyone else uh, yeah hope <laughs> hopefully i got you know there's some takeaways from this but uh we'll see oh, absolutely sure. thank you so much and cool. um yeah take care thanks luke i'll hopefully see you soon yes sooner than later in a couple yes. weeks maybe <laughs> okay cool yeah and uh you know good luck to you guys out there um and uh you know uh, i you know i got to watch all these older other videos that in this series and uh it's kind of fascinating stuff it's like you know way over my head a lot of it but uh you know, I can do the drama stuff though. Yeah. Well, thanks for your contribution.